Welcome to Ruto Valentino Connections. Today's video is entitled Ruto Valentino, His Box Office Appeal During 1922 and Beyond, Illustrated in One Theater's Billheads. 100 years ago in December, Ruto Valentino was ending his, quote, breakout year, unquote, as he rose to full film stardom. And this paragraph actually just details again all the films he made, when he made them, when they were released, and a companion post, Ruto Valentino Joins Paramount's Gallery of Stars, is also available on YouTube. As Valentino's star rose, many of his earlier films were booked again to capitalize on his popularity, and they played around the country even as his new films were premiering during 1922. Among these were some of the early films before he was a star, as well as some of the bigger films such as The Conquering Power and The Four Horsemen, of the apocalypse. And of course, the sheik played on. The ad below is for my collection, and it's for Frivolous Wives. This was actually a recut version of the 1918 The Married Virgin. Now, this is a big ad. I've only shown part of the full page of the paper, but it's quite obvious that the ad for Valentino's old film took up a great deal of that page. All the glittering premieres held in cities like New York and Los Angeles attracted important reviewers and big box office numbers, but theaters in smaller cities and even smaller towns were where the ultimate success of a film was determined. Audiences who went to the movies for an afternoon matinee or night out were the people who kept a star's light blazing. The Palace Theater in the small community of Antigua, Wisconsin was typical of many venues around the United States and Canada. The Palace Theater still exists. Today, the Palace Twin Theater has two screens with a total of 1,000 seats. I've included a brief history provided by the Langlade Historical Society, and I found this at a site called Cinema Treasures. The theater was founded by one Harvey Hansen, who came to Antigua around 1908 and started in the theater business. In 1909, he built a building with his name on it, and that's where he started showing films. And then later, by around 1916, he opened the New Palace Theater, which was at the time the only fireproof theater in central Wisconsin. I've included a couple pictures of the Antigua Theater, um, showing a couple of changes over time, as well as a picture of the actual Main Street of Antigua, Wisconsin, in 1922. The Palace Theater is visible just behind the lunch sign on the right of this picture. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse actually had a scheduling mix-up before it was back at the Palace Theater in the fall of 1922. There were always mix-ups and scheduling dates for other films as well, but the letter below shows a particular misunderstanding on the part of the theater's management as to which entity actually controlled the picture. It seems that the issue was resolved in a letter written to Mr. H. E. Hansen on May 29, 1922, and dates for a four-day booking were set for September 25th through 28th, 1922. This letter, which is in my collection, shows that more than a year after the original March 21st release of The Four Horsemen, the film continued to attract a large audience. Unfortunately, there was no discussion about the rental fee, but figures at the lower left of the page suggest that the fee may have been $75 a day, with a deduction for some reason of one day's fee, resulting in a total fee of $225. This charge would have been equal to what was charged for Beyond the Rocks in December of 1922. A billhead is defined as a letterhead used for statements of charges. The bill head pictured on the screen is from my collection and is titled Notice of Exhibition Dates. It shows the rental fees the Palace Theater owed to Paramount Pictures, Famous Players, Lasky Productions. Information on this type of theater bill head included the name of the film, the shipping date, the number of the print shipped to the theater, and the scheduled exhibition days and dates for the months involved. This billhead covers shipping dates during the period between October 30th through December 25th, 1922. Looking down the list of films on this billhead, only eight films had three-day runs during this two-month period, with a check mark marking the last day of the run, which would be a Saturday. Of those films, 
three were Valentino pictures. I'd like to note that in the discussion that follows, I will often refer to, quote, a possible second run, unquote, at the theater. Without all the bill heads for this theater, it is impossible to know exactly when first runs of some films took place. Some pictures were distributed more quickly to the country's heartland than others. With the big films, I've speculated in some cases that enough time may have passed since an initial release to allow for a second booking during the time frame of this billhead. In the next part of this video, we'll take a look at the rental fees paid by the Palace Theater during the last two months of the year, and how other films stacked up against Ruta Valentino's releases. For a larger image of this billhead, you can visit the community page on this YouTube channel or the original blog post. In the first part of this discussion, I will focus on the three films that were actually on this billhead, The Sheik, Miranda the Lady Letty, and Beyond the Rocks. The first Valentino film on this billhead is The Sheik, which was back for a run starting on November 9th, nearly a year after its initial release in 1921. During the first two weeks of November, of the seven movies shown, the Antigo Theater paid the most for The Sheik, $70, which illustrates the staying power of this film. The film listed at the very bottom of this group is The Affairs of Anatole, which was still a very popular film. It had actually held the box office record in New York City for opening day until The Sheik arrived. It premiered actually two months before The Sheik. This film was directed by Cecil B. DeMille, and it included Agnes Ayers, who starred in The Sheik, but the lead roles were played by the very popular heartthrob Wallace Reed and top female star Gloria Swanson. In addition to Swanson, cast members Wanda Hawley, B.B. Daniels, and Ruth Miller had already played in a Valentino film or would play in one in the future. This film started its run at the Palace on November 16, 1922. The Affairs of Anatole would be booked for a fee of $35. Now, there's a bit of a mix-up with the order of the films on this billhead. The film Don't Tell Everything was actually shipped out on October 31st and started its run on November 2nd. The Sheik was actually shipped out on November 7th, and it played starting on November 9th. However, on the billhead, The Sheik is listed first instead of being after Don't Tell Everything. An interesting story surrounds Don't Tell Everything, which was booked for a rental fee of $40. This film originated from outtakes and extra footage from The Affairs of Anatole, which would be shown only a couple of weeks later. One note of interest here. On November 15th, a British short titled Love's Boomerang was booked for a $10 rental fee. The title director for this film was a man named Alfred Hitchcock. The next Valentino film listed on this billhead is Moran of the Lady Letty, which shipped out on November 28, 1922, and began its run on November 30th. It had a rental fee of $50. It was actually released in February of 1922, so it's most likely that this was a second run. Moran of the Lady Letty was actually sandwiched between two DeMille productions. The week before, there was a three-day run of Saturday Night, a film that had been released on January 29, 1922. So it may also have been returning for another showing. It had the same rental fee as Moran of the Lady Letty, $50. So it's clear that Saturday Night continued to have audience appeal. The weekend after the run of Moran of the Lady Letty, the feature was Fool's Paradise, which ran from December 7th through 9th. This film commanded a rental fee of $70, which matched the fee that had been paid for The Sheik a month earlier. Fool's Paradise was another Cecil B. DeMille production, which starred Dorothy Dalton. It had been released one year earlier on December 9, 1921, and drew critical praise as well as excellent reviews for Dalton. Exhibitors Herald considered Dalton's performance as the best she had done to that point, 
and found her, quote, piquant and charming, unquote, in the role of cantina dancer Paul Patchouli. The popularity and staying power of this film is obvious, as a year later, its rental fee matched the fee charged for The Chic, starring Valentino. And I'd also like to give a reminder at this point that I did an exhaustive four-part series on Miranda the Lady Letty, which is available here on YouTube. The third Valentino film showing here at the theater was Beyond the Rocks, which began to run on December 21st. It had been released in May of 1922, so it's possible that this was another run at the theater. Beyond the Rocks carried a $75 rental fee, $5 more than the fee for The Chic. The pairing of Swanson, Paramount's top star, with the newly popular Valentino warranted this higher rental fee. And I do have a prior video up on Paramount's Gallery of Stars. A week before Beyond the Rocks was shown, a film called Forever was in the theater, and it carried a $50 fee, which matched the rental fee of the newer release, Miranda the Lady Letty. Forever is another film with an interesting backstory. Forever was released on October 16, 1921, under the title Peter Ibbotson, and went into nationwide release in early March of 1922. Under this title, it was playing in New York City when The Sheik premiered on November 6, 1921. In fact, both films appeared in a joint ad the day after The Sheik premiered, I've included this ad in a post that's available on my website and also in a video here called The Start of Chic Week. Forever starred Wallace Reed and Elsie Ferguson and was directed by George Fitzmaurice. Fitzmaurice was a director Valentino had wanted to work with from early in his time at Paramount. His chance to have Fitzmaurice direct him would come only at the very end of his career when Fitzmaurice directed The Son of the Chic. Tucked in the middle of the schedule was a Wednesday, December 20th showing of The Ordeal, which had been released on May 21st, 1922. It was a melodrama co-written by Somerset Maugham and was only 50 minutes long. Agnes Ayres, who had been the lead in The Chic only six months before, and Conrad Nagel, a popular actor, apparently couldn't bolster its appeal. Six months later, the rental fee was only $10. One film that is notable for its very low $15 rental fee is Beauty's Worth, which was booked after Christmas Day for one day on Wednesday, December 27th. This film starred Marion Davies, and it definitely was not a short. This film was actually rather elaborate, as it recreated a dancing doll routine that Davies did in the 1916 edition of the Ziegfeld Follies. Exhibitors Herald gave it a full review, noted that there was a thin story, but thought the film would have audience appeal because of its excellent production. With the low rental fee due to the fact that business might be slow during this period, in addition to industry-wide financial issues, I can only observe that by 1924, Marion Davies would be the number one box office female attraction. But this was 1922, and she hadn't reached her peak popularity. The low rental fee late in the year of release could simply illustrate how a film's appeal could taper off dramatically. The two new 1922 Valentino releases that are missing from this billhead are Blood and Sand and The Young Raja. Blood and Sand had its New York premiere on Sunday, August 6th, so it most likely had a first run before the start date of this billhead, which was October 30th. The Young Raja had a November 12th release, so the Palace Theater would have had its first booking sometime in early 1923. This timing is evident in many ads, which appeared in newspapers around the country and away from the big cities, which I did see during my research. According to news reports, Blood and Sand on its first Monday, quote, drew 500 more than went to see him the first Monday he appeared in the Sheik, when he set a new Monday attendance record at the theater. Unquote. A couple of months later, the young Raja broke the opening day record set by Blood and Sand when it opened at the Rivoli on November 5th. Seems that each new release seemed to draw a bigger audience than the prior film did, at least at the New York openings. 
1923, there were no new productions for Valentino. So what happened when Blood and Sand and the Young Raja returned to the Palace Theater about a year later? The Sheik still commanded a fee of $70 for a year after its release, while Beyond the Rocks was still at a peak of $75 six months after its premiere. I do not have a record of the initial rental fees for Blood and Sand or The Young Raja, but there seemed to be a big drop-off a year later for these two films. Blood and Sand had a rental fee of $50 for a September 1923 showing. This is a bit surprising, since the film was one of the highest-grossing films of 1922 and had given Valentino his first star billing. Surely the initial rental fee must have been in the range of the already aging Beyond the Rocks and the Sheik. The fee for the young Raja is even more surprising, $25 for its November showing. The early showings in 1922 had drawn strong audiences, but a year later, the waning appeal of this quote-unquote big film had dropped the rental fee to the level of some of the program pictures on the billhead that were running at the Palace Theater in 1922. The question is, why? In the case of The Young Raja, the reviews had not been very enthusiastic, but that was not the case for Blood and Sand. Perhaps the problem was that by November 1923, Valentino had been off the screen for a year after going on strike. The tumult had gone public by August 1922, and the long legal battle continued until the moves began in mid-1923 to end the impasse with the studio. In spite of Valentino's efforts to stay in the public's eye, the dance tour, the poetry book, the bodybuilding publicity, being off screen without new films would have been an issue for any film career's momentum. And naturally, the studio actively promoted other actors during this time, notably casting Antonio Moreno opposite Gloria Swanson. As early as September 1922, just a month after Blood and Sand's triumphant premiere and rave reviews for Valentino's performance, and well before The Young Raja opened in mid-November, the reports were out about the Moreno-Swanson pairing in My American Wife. That would be directed by Sam Wood, who directed Beyond the Rocks. At the same time, Ramon Navarro, who had been an extra in The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, was being championed by Rex Ingram, and appeared in his first good supporting role in The Prisoner of Zenda, released a matter of weeks before Blood and Sand. It was still playing on Broadway at the Astor Theater when Blood and Sand opened. There were large head-to-head -head ads for both films when Blood and Sand debuted, and in my blog post, as well as the video entitled The Start of Chic Week, you can see these ads. In 1923, Navarro had his first starring role in Scaramouche, released in September, which, despite the cost, did make money and would break box office records in Paris and London. Also in the public eye was Douglas Fairbanks, then known as the King of Hollywood, who released Robin Hood on October 18, 1922. This film was not only a great hit, but its premiere 100 years ago is now cited as the first modern movie premiere and red carpet event. So the first half of 1922 had brought Valentino to true star status, but by the end of the year, his momentum as an actor stalled. Although he did attend the premiere of The Young Raja in New York while carrying on his legal fight with the studio, his energies in 1923 would be aimed at earning money using his celebrity rather than through his film career. And while he was off screen, there were missed opportunities that may have helped erase the memory of the disappointing reception of the young Raja. Valentino's next film, The Spanish Cavalier, which had already begun pre-production when he went on strike, was completely reworked to have a female lead. The Spanish dancer would star Pola Negri playing against Antonio Moreno and would be released in November 1923, only a couple of months before Valentino would finally return to work. Then, in 1924, Valentino's first effort when he returned was Monsieur Beaucaire, which started filming in early 1924 in New York. Interestingly, 
Douglas Fairbanks had purchased the property in 1922, thinking he would make his version after completing Robin Hood. Eventually, Fairbanks would sell his rights to the story. Valentino's opulent, much-anticipated version, his comeback film, was released during August 1924, drawing large crowds in bigger cities in the U.S. and Europe, but losing audience in smaller cities and towns across the country, such as Antigo, Wisconsin. I do not know if the showing of Beaucaire on the last two days of 1924 was a first showing or a return booking at the Palace Theater. Regardless, the rental fee for this extravagant comeback film was only $45. This fee was higher than the $25 fee for Valentino's last film, The Young Raja, a year before, but below the $50 fee for Blood and Sand one year after its release and less than for a first run of Moran of the Lady Letty. And it was only two-thirds the booking fee for Beyond the Rocks and a repeat run of The Sheik. The reception of Beaucaire would illustrate how the all-important audiences away from the sophisticated large cities would be instrumental to the level of success of Rudolf Valentino's comeback. Publicity and reviews could launch a film, but the general public still needed to be willing to buy tickets and Rudolf Valentino's comeback was off to an uneven start. Of course, I have my notes and sources here. In the notes, I have an acknowledgement. The billhead in my collection, the one at the start, the long and all-encompassing billhead, was purchased from an eBay seller, Mr. Buys a Lot, who had permitted me to use images of the other smaller billheads that are pictured in this post and video. I have since added those billheads to my collection. His store features, among other things, items from a huge trove of documents retrieved from the Palace Theater. The notes also include a bit of information about the Four Horsemen letterhead and the logo, which reads Distributors of Nazimova Productions and what that's all about, as well as a link to the story about the 100th anniversary of the first big movie event, premiere event, that occurred with Douglas Fairbanks' Robin Hood. Thanks for watching. This was a very intricate uh, thing to pull together, and I hope you can plow through it and enjoy it. Thanks so much.